Hi everyone. Uh, so today we will be talking about the orthopedic part of uh, grand test 180. Uh, to start with the question number 47, this seems to be a pretty simple question. Uh, identify the bone tumors. So the choices are Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, giant cell tumor and enchondroma. So the Ewing sarcoma is basically involves the diaphyseal portion of the bone in the, the young adults whereas this tumor seems to be involving the metaphyseal area. So uh, this is not going to be the answer. So osteosarcoma involves the metaphyseal area so this tumor is also involving the metaphyseal area and uh, giant cell tumor whereas involved the epiphyseal area so this epiphyseal area is not involved so giant cell tumor is out also out of question. Enchondroma usually involves the small wounds of hands and feet. So that is also of question. So osteosarcoma seems to be the right choice. Moreover, if you see, there is a, a break in the breach in the cortex also. And there is a sunray appearance also, which also all goes in the favor of osteosarcoma. So if you see this image, shows metaphyseal sclerotic lesion with breach of the cortex with extension of the tumor under periosteum producing a typical sun ray appearance. So this is nothing else but osteosarcoma which is B in this question. The question 48. So a teenage girl, the teenage girl, so the age is very important in this question, presented with a complaint of pain in the knee on climbing stairs or getting up from the sitting position. So these, this thing explains that her patellofemoral joint seems to be involved because pain in the knee joint while going upstairs or getting up from the sitting, sitting position usually involves the patellofemoral joint. So what is the probable diagnosis? Chondromalacia patelli, as we have already discussed, is the most common cause of anterior knee pain in youngsters. The plica syndrome also could be one of the reasons, but usually the symptoms in plica syndrome are like of meniscal symptoms like locking. Uh, the other thing you will see patellofemoral arthritis yet that usually involves the elderly, not the teenage patients, and bipartite patella is usually a asymptomatic congenital condition uh, which patient usually have since birth and doesn't lead to pain. So in my opinion the answer of this question is going to be A, the chondromalacia patelli. Have a look at the few other slides. So the bipartite patella is a congenital fragmentation of the patella and usually asymptomatic, doesn't lead to pain in most of the cases. The plica syndrome, in this case there is inflammation of the synovial folds and it presents as a meniscal symptoms of a locking. As we said, patellofemoral arthritis is seen in elderly age patients. So chondromalacia patelli is the most common cause of anterior knee pain in youngsters or teenagers. So what happens here, uh, as the name suggests, chondro means cartilage, malacia means to become soft patella is under the surface of patella. So in this case the cartilage becomes soft. So whenever patient is bending the knee for sitting or getting up or going upstairs, so this the soft cartilage portion will get pressed between the patella and the femoral condyles and will start paining. So this is uh, the answer of the question number 48 is chondromalacia patelli. The next question is 48 year old female presented to the cleaning after 3 months of tibial fracture. So now it has been 3 months since she had the fracture of tibia. Uh, following a blunt trauma with history of pain, she has got a pain now, swelling is there. Okay, from 8 to 10 days, her skin of the leg has become shiny, cold and edematous. There is no history of hypertension or diabetes. What is the diagnosis? So if we see out of these, uh, she doesn't have any history of diabetes. So she cannot have peripheral uh, neuropathy. So usually the lower limb and upper limbs are very prone to develop a disorder of the nervous system, which we call complex regional pain syndrome. 
okay in complex regional pain syndrome type 1 there is no damage to the nerves whereas in type 2 there is a damage to the nerves so if we look at the few other slides this is also known as pseudex atrophy or reflex sympathetic dystrophy it usually occurs in the injuries around the wrist and hand or foot and ankle so there is a malfunction of the peripheral nervous system or and central nervous system uh, and that leads to aberrant response uh, to the tissue injury so if you see the clinical features uh, you will see a lot of swelling on the hand or the involved limb so the skin will be swollen and tense and will be red okay and there will be continuous burning and throbbing pain patient even if you try to touch the hand patient will pull his leg or foot away from you because the sensitivity has increased so there will be a lot of sweating to that area and skin color will be changed usually uh, becomes blue or red okay and uh, joint stiffness will be there because of swelling and restriction of the movements okay so all these features will be seen in something called pseudex osteodystrophy or you can say a complex regional pain syndrome so the treatment of this pathology is the main thing is physiotherapy we have to try to reduce the edema by compression bandage elevation and try to mobilize the joint by doing the active exercises the drugs usually are anti-inflammatories or nerve soothing agents like pregabalin or carbapentin other thing which you can do is you can block the sympathetic nervous system uh, by uh, different drugs okay and uh, vitamin c has been shown to be effective in reducing the uh, complex regional pain syndrome there are various studies which shows that vitamin c limits the tissue injury and hence prevents the development of the complex regional pain syndrome nerve blocks will block the nervous system sympathetic nervous system and help to relieve the symptom because there is no injury to the nerves but there is an aberrant response from the nervous system so we term it complex regional syndrome type 1 so answer to the question number 49 is going to be A the question number 50 Thomas test is done for well this is a pretty simple question all of you must be knowing so but to understand that that the this is done to check the fixed flexion deformity of the hip now if we have any deformity in the anterior posterior plane in the hip so that will be compensated at the spine in the anterior posterior plane so if we have fixed flexion deformity of the hip will have lordosis in the spine if we have fixed extension deformity of the hip which is very rare then you will have kyphosis in the spine if we have some uh, adduction or abduction deformity in, in the spine which is in the uh, mediolateral plane then you will have some sort of scoliosis in your lumbar spine so in fixed flexion deformity usually a person develops lordosis of the spine so whenever he is lying on the bed straight his spine will be lifted up it will not lumbar spine will not be touching the uh, bed because there is the exaggerated lumbar lordosis to to correct that lordosis we ask the patient to flex the normal limb okay so when the patient flexes the normal limb that lordosis gets corrected and the patient's back will be touching the couch so in doing so the deformity which was compensated in the lumbar spine will reappear in the hip joint and your hip will be lifted like this and you can measure this angle which will give you how much is the fixed flexion deformity in the hip joint so the Thomas test question number 50 is done to assess the fixed flexion deformity of the hip joint so the answer is B the question number 51 from and sign is positive in well from and sign is something like this so basically this test is done to check the uh, uh, paralysis of the adductor pollicis adductor pollicis is the muscle which you will see 
somewhere here in the first pep space okay this muscle is helpful in adduction so if this muscle goes away the adduction will be limited and this will be taken over by the flexor pollicis which flexes our thumb so we ask the patient to uh, hold a piece of paper in th hand like this okay if his adductor pollicis is working properly so he will be using the adductor pollicis to hold this as he is using in this hand so if his adductor pollicis is not working he will use the flexor pollicis to hold this thing so you will see a kind of flexion at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb while holding the paper or a card so we call this a froment sign so froment sign is positive in ulna injury because adductor pollicis is something which is supplied by the ulna so the answer of the question number 51 is going to be b the froment sign is seen in ulnar nerve injuries identify the deformity seen in the pictures so this is a deformity of the great toe we also call it hollex so so this is going to be either hollex valgus or varus which one is that we'll decide in a little while this cannot be coitus valgus because coitus valgus is usually a deformity of the elbow and they have shown us a foot so it is going to be hallux valgus or varus uh, another possible option is rheumatoid nodule also let's have a look how all these things look like so when our great two or we can say the metatarsophalangeal joint great two at the metatars first metatarsophalangeal joints go in outwards position outward then we call it hallux valgus when it goes into inward side now this is the center of our body uh, middle part of the body so it goes inwards we call it hollex varus uh, rheumatoid nodules they sometimes look like this so the, usually the deformed they have shown is of grade 2 and this is your coitus valgus so because in the given picture the grade 2 has gone outwards so this is hollex valgus deformity the answer of the question number 52 is going to be hollex valgus now postural scoliosis is differentiated from the structural scoliosis by uh, there is a test uh, we call it adams test now if scoliosis is basically of two types structural scoliosis there is a some sort of uh, deformity in the formation of the spine then postural scoliosis which occurs or which happens due to the uh, wrong posture or let's say to compensate any sort of uh, you can say uh, deformity in the limb let's say valgus and varus deformity can be compensated in the spine with the help of scoliosis now if you make the patient sit down or bend forward so that postural component will disappear okay so if there is a postural scoliosis and we ask the patient to bend forward the scoliosis will disappear but if the scoliosis is structural so that will become more prominent on bending forward so the postural scoliosis will disappear on bending forward whereas the structural scoliosis will become will not disappear or become more prominent so so adam test is useful in differentiated between structural and postural scoliosis so answer of the question number 53 is going to be c the postural curve will disappear on forward flexion so that's adam's test kebab treatment is used in the treatment of which of the following conditions well out of these osteogenesis and perfecta is something which where, where we use the kebab treatment to correct the deformities how we do that let's have a look at the next few slides as we all know osteogenesis imperfecta is a hereditary condition which results from the faulty or decreased formation of type 1 collagen okay so there could be abnormal production of the collagen or there could be decreased production of the collagen type 1 collagen so due to that there will be plenty of bony deformities or features first of all the the bone will become fragile and that will be prone to fractures uh, fractures usually heal 
uh, in normal fashion, but remodeling will not be there. Ligament laxity is another feature of osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, short stature and scoliosis are also features of osteogenesis imperfecta because bones become weak and discs are usually uh, uh, strong, uh, so they can um, lead to codfish vertebra due to compression of the vertebras at multiple sites. So you will see this kind of codfish vertebras. Okay. Uh, because of weakness of the bone due to weight bearing, there could be progressive bowing of the limbs, coxa vara, or other dislocation of the radial head as you can see because of the deformities can also develop in osteogenesis imperfecta. So basically the kebab treatment is done to correct these kind of deformities which we develop in osteogenesis imperfecta because if you try to put a nail straight in that, that will come out at some other point. So to correct that deformity, we do multiple osteotomies and multiple sites and we'll put a, a nail in all those osteosomites osteotomized fragments uh, like this as it is shown in this picture. So this is called kebab treatment which is used in the treatment of osteogenesis imperfecta. So the answer to the question number 54 is D. So next question is the most appropriate treatment for six year old boy with the displaced fractures though shown in the figure is now we all know this is a little condyle fracture because this is on the radial side of the elbow and radius is usually on the lateral aspect. So this has broken from here this is the little condyle fracture of the humerus and if you see the chances of non-union or mal-union are very high in little condyle fracture okay so why the mal-union or non-union is because if we reduce this fracture and we do not hold it properly with the help of some surgical intervention fixation with wire or screws the constant pull of the collateral ligament and the common extensors will keep on putting a pull over this fragment and that can lead to non-union or mal-union this fragment. So that's why you need to reduce it properly and you need to fix it with some sort of uh, metal. So usually either screw or two wires are sufficient to maintain this kind of fracture. So the ideal treatment for treatment of the little condyle fracture is open reduction and internal fixation. So the answer to the question number 55 is D. So next question is question 56 the following test is known as well this is you all know is Phelan's test which is done to reproduce the symptoms of the carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel syndrome as you know is the most common entrapment neuropathy of the median nerve in the wrist under the fracture retina column in the carpal tunnel. So in doing to reproduce these symptoms we flex the wrist at around 90 degrees so that what it will do it will it will put pressure of the median nerve and median nerve will be compressed and the symptoms will be produced in literal three and half fingers paresthesia and weakness of the dinar muscles can result so this is a phalanx test which is done for uh, median nerve uh, entrapment that is carpenter syndrome so the answer of 56 question is C. So that was end of uh, grand test 180. Thank you for your